Uh, but it's nice to see such a strong turnout on day two of the Global Women's Forum. Uh, I was flattered that they mentioned my name, but I'm really not the star of this panel. Let's put it that way, right? Uh, we have four powerhouses from each uh, element of government, and I mean that genuinely because I've had a chance to have conference calls and speak to their staffs and the rest uh, with the clarity that they have in terms of gender equality. Uh, I'm not sure about you, but I'm sure you all know this, but when I heard the numbers that uh, the IMF managing director shared yesterday that just in the Middle East and North Africa, if we get, get gender parity and make the gains that we want in the next 10 years, it would add a trillion dollars to GDP. But then I went last night before we went on the program with that interview, and I was talking to uh, Becky Anderson about it. I said it's extraordinary because the GDP in the Middle East and North Africa is just $3 trillion. So over 10 years, you could add a trillion dollars to GDP uh, by getting that balance. So let's welcome all our guests, and we can give a nice round of applause at the end. Rania al mashad is the Minister of International Cooperation for Egypt. Uh, she was awarded for her excellent work by the government and internationally uh, for her work in transforming the Ministry of Tourism. It's good to see you. Miriam al Mahari is the Minister of Food Security here uh, in the UAE. Uh, her Excellency Lana Musebi is the uh, representative ambassador to the United Nations, special representative uh, in New York for the, the government here. And Mimosa, I'm going to look down because I make sure I get the pronunciation right. Mimosa Kusari Lila is a member of parliament from Kosovo. She was the first mayor of her hometown uh, as a female uh, and was the deputy prime minister and minister of trade and industry for the country as well. Let's give them a nice warm welcome to the stage. I wanted to start with, uh, if you will, somewhat of a, a general question to, to you, Rania, because uh, you worked in the International Monetary Fund, right? Mm -hmm. Would you say, when you had that time there that was gender blindness, did you ever feel like somebody was looking and said, is she qualified as a woman? Because we would never ask that question of a man. Was that man qualified for the job? And I'm just trying to get a sense for this audience. In international organizations, is it still a challenge at the same time? Well, let me uh, go a little bit back and uh, this is going to show the evolution of the topic itself. So I started first at the IMF uh, in 2001. And at that time, we used to have brown bag lunches as women, okay, to see how we can encourage each other to do internal mobility. And these were uh, individual efforts. Hmm. There was no mainstream in the institution to actually uh, bring the topic to the fore. This has changed tremendously. Hmm. The IMF was the institution that always does, and uh, still does, financial policy, monetary policy, etc. But to have in 2015 a paper come out and quantify how women's participation in economies adds to GDP, that was a breakthrough for the IMF. And the term that was used, women participation, is macro-critical. Uh, and this opens the door to, uh, in the design of uh, programs with the IMF, et cetera, you always put a gender element. So I think that uh, in all institutions, uh, the women element has actually progressed. It progressed in a way where it's no longer just lip service or a statistic that needs to increase, but the quantification of the matter has added a lot uh, of importance, has added a lot of um, um, guidance in policy work, in private sector engagement, et cetera. So I think uh, not just in the region, but globally, uh, women issues uh, are important uh, and have uh, been at the uh, priority of many institutions. You're a trained economist. Uh, the numbers I was talking about before, I think, are extraordinary, how much you could unleash in an economy, which is quite mature in many markets around the world. So you're looking for new areas of growth. Uh, this is so obvious that in, and in front of us that you could empower people even with fiscal policies. Do you want to address that quickly? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, uh, to have um, uh, equal pay, to have women in leadership roles, uh, to allow access when it comes to uh, whether it's transportation, daycare, close to, like when we had the IMF program uh, in Egypt uh, between 2016 and 2019, uh, there was an element uh, where uh, the government had to allow for daycares uh, to, uh, to basically encourage more women participation. Um, in Egypt, uh, there are around 48 million women. 
uh, 23 million are mm. actually supporting families. So 14% of families in Egypt are supported by, by women. And uh, what the government is trying to do is to allow better access to financing, uh, to allow um, uh, more uh, inclusion when it comes to banks, when it comes to access to credit, uh, basically to unleash uh, exactly as you say. We have a national uh, um, strategy uh, which uh, is uh, outlined by the National Council for Women, comes under the president. Uh, the, on the political side, uh, eight cabinet members are female, that's 25%, uh, uh, and then we have uh, more than 19% uh, in parliament. So things are progressing, there's political empowerment, economic empowerment through uh, these different targets when it comes to access to finance. There's the social empowerment where you're trying to uh, also change uh, the societal idea about women's participation. I just want to say one thing on women in government since the panel is about that. Uh, any one of us uh, in government, uh, as a woman, we have two tasks. One is to prove yourself in whatever portfolio uh, you are leading, but then uh, you also open the door for other women if you do a good job. Right. Uh, and that is extremely important, uh, that um, uh, if you do a good job, societal perception changes. They become also gender blind. She did a good job, he did a good job, Who, whoever's competent can be there. Mm. And also it, it gives uh, political leadership more uh, um, strength when, uh, and more argument when to they push it again. to push it again. Okay, great. Uh, Miriam, you know, we were talking about it yesterday, about the kind of the very clear focus that the UAE government, and actually I have to be honest, I see a lot of women in cabinet like <laughs> yourself, or I sit in the PMO's office here in Dubai, and then uh, chaired by uh, uh, Her Excellency Ohud, and you're yes. like, okay, where did this woman come from? <laughs> and the talent spot in a very early stage of uh, grooming the next generation of leaders here. What were the concrete steps that most people don't know about? I mean, I was just thinking, wow, these are fantastic leaders at the top, they just yeah. spot good talent. But it's much more methodical yes. than that. Do you want to share that? Yes, thank you so much. First of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I'll start with where it all started here in the UAE. Um, our late founding father, His Highness Sheikh Zayed, when he built the first school in the UAE, he didn't just build a boys' school, he built a girls' school. So already in times when this was very uncommon, mm. he already understood that women play a huge part in uh, the country's development. And he basically said, you know, half of my society are, fi are women, so we need to give them as well the chance so that we can grow as a country. And I would say those were the seeds that he seeded to bring us mm. where we are today. And today, a third of the cabinet are women, 50% uh, of our, our parliament, the Federal National Council, are women. These are all basically outcomes of all the initiatives and all the steps that have been taken. And having you all here and discussing and sharing what the UAE has done is exactly what we're doing here as well. So I would say it came from the values instilled by um, our, our leadership, and we're basically on that journey. And uh, we're here, we're empowered, and it's really wonderful for us because they give us the, the energy, they give us the, 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 they enable us to do whatever we feel is right for our society. Let me follow up because I'll use you as a case study because yeah. the portfolio of food security is vital here in the yes, Gulf, particularly yes. with uh, climate change. Yeah, and I know absolutely. You're, you're pushing the envelope on that front. Yeah. Well, the reason I wanted to use you as an example because uh, it was thought, oh, we could have, an, uh, you know, it's always so dangerous as a man speaking like this, but I <laughs> come with a, a, yeah. as a father of two teenagers, which you guys are setting the example mm -hmm. for. Yeah. Uh, it's not window dressing anymore. It's not like no, let's give it's... women places in the cabinet because it's the right thing to do cosmetically. Uh, this, the woman next to you uh, yes. representing the country in the United, in the United Nations, right? Yeah, so give right. us a sense of the, do you feel the burden of like, this is a serious portfolio yeah. and they want me to oh, perform? Absolutely. It came actually from my passion of diving. So I, I was diving and I was seeing the marine environment and I was seeing the resources we have underwater. And I, this is where I started to go into aquaculture and understanding what fisheries is for the UAE and how we have to ensure that with climate change effects, we start looking at other means of sourcing our fish. This is where it all started. So I actually saw things myself 
Um, I have some uh, German background, and my grandmother uh, went through World War II, so she she was always telling us about not wasting food and what experiences she went through as a mother of many children at the time when there was no food. Mm. Um, so these stories, I think they, they formed my mindset in understanding how important food security is. And then, of course, being in a country that is water scarce, we don't have, uh, we have less than 5% arable land, we understood to be able to be food secure, we have to be a hub of food trade. So we built the infrastructure, the mm. airlines, I'm sure all of you had the pleasure of flying Emirates Airlines or Etihad Airways. So the airlines, the ports, all that infrastructure enabled food to be traded and brought into the country and some stayed and some were re-exported as well. So this flow of food gave us the accessibility of food, but we also understand that in the future, we know population is on the rise, which means food demand is also on the rise. We know our behavior, we're wasting a lot of food, um, is also influencing the food system globally. And so our leadership have seen that food security needs to be a national priority because of the challenges that are lying ahead and because we are a country that doesn't produce a lot of food. So we need to plan to be able to be food secure not only today, but also in future. Great. Uh, Lana, you brought nine ambassadors uh, from the United Nations and you said, look, I'd like to focus because we know the work that's being done in the UAE. You know, you're a beacon, if you will, because everybody was like, wow, that's quite a promotion for somebody and you've proven your mettle there. But I'd love to get your insights within the United Nations itself. And we had the managing director of the IMF, we've had two in a row. Uh, what sort of culture is there to get women pushed into the agenda? And then now that we have women inside, what sort of difference it's making through all the different UN agencies, would you suggest? Thank you, John, for having us. And thank you also for not leading what we call in UN speak a manal. So a panel comprised entirely of men. Uh, and you know you what happens now. I was at the World Economic Forum. They're like, we must have a woman. We must have one woman. It's like, why don't we have all women? I think that's, that's I'll much just better. moderate. <laughs> but much better. Just on a more serious point, uh, I and the other nine ambassadors here are what we are, what is known as gender champions. So we commit to not accepting roles to be on panels where we're the only woman. And I think that's one of the examples of how you can impact positive change at the United Nations. I'd like to acknowledge the nine women ambassadors who've come from New York to be here with us. Albania, Afghanistan, Hungary, El Salvador, Grenada, uh, Maldives, Eritrea, Slovenia, and Czech Republic, please stand up. These women are pioneers at the United Nations. They will be partners uh, leading us into the CSW. The I'm starting to feel very lonely. I was looking around. I don't think there's any other men in the room. <laughs> they will be leading us into the Commission of Status of Women negotiations that start in April as we also review what has happened since Beijing in 1995 and the mm. global call to action for gender empowerment around the world. Uh, and I think to Rania's point, to Miriam's point, uh, it is really important that we work together collaboratively, collaboratively to build up these initiatives uh, in the United Nations internationally where it really matters, but also regionally and globally. So these networks, these brown bag lunches, they are really important parts uh, of some of the solution to these really, really critical challenges. What are we doing at the United Nations? Well, to your point about um, is it enshrined in uh, UN speak that parity is a given? Not really. If you look at the UN Charter, a document forged out of the consensus of World War II, it actually describes the Secretary General as a man, he, in Article 97. Wow. He shall be someone of uh, good quali qualifications. Wow. So if you look at that, if you look at our, our founding document as an international organization of 193 member states and look where we've come today, you can see where we've had to move the dial just from that document. And documentation Jeez. does matter. That's why the UAE Constitution enshrines gender equality in the Constitution because all legislation emanates from that. So equal pay for equal work, et cetera, is not an issue in this country. It's mm. part of our law. Uh, and I think that in the United Nations, luckily we have had under the leadership of this current Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, what he would describe as a feminist Secretary Generalship. So he's committed uh, to ensuring that at the high levels of UN agencies, there is 50-50 parity with, with men and women leading those agencies. And I think you need that kind of firm commitment from the top. As Miriam described, you see that very much here in the leadership of this country. Um, but you also need it in the organization that best reflects the ideals of the global community. And I think that's what the UN is. Every day when we walk into that building, we look at ourselves as we would want to be as countries, as an international community. We strive to be better. 
all of us. I don't think any of us would describe our countries and our policies as perfect. But we would all like to strive to be better, and I think that's what we do at the UN in, in those negotiations. And we learn from each other. We learn from each other's best practice. So UN Women, the agency mandated to lead on that gender uh, parity agenda, is one where the UAE is, for example, one of the top 20 donors. These are the kinds of ways, but it's not just financial. As many of my female colleagues will know, and we only number about 50 today at the UN, it's, it's a big improvement, but it's not parity. It's about how we approach the issue at the United Nations. It's how we integrate it, not just into gender issues or human rights issues, but across the continuum of the peace and security architecture. So gender empowerment is a peace and security issue. Well, if, let me follow up on that, because it's a point that uh, Christina Georgieva made yesterday, mm -hmm is that it's proven that if we have women as part of negotiations, it usually ends up in a much more peaceful way. And the women and children are subject to violence more than anybody else when it comes to conflict. Mm -hmm. How about the Security Council itself, which has become almost ineffective because of the positions countries have taken even before they get to uh, the talks? What can women do here to change the narrative when it comes to peace and security, would you mm -hmm. say, suggest? It's an important question. The UN Security Council hasn't become ineffective because the Security Council itself or the UN is ineffective. The Security Council is a reflection of global realities today. So the Security Council can't be any better than the coordination between member states and the political will to negotiate uh, solutions. Having said that, and again, this is why the normative framework created by the United Nations is so important for setting benchmarks and standards, uh, UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which many of my colleagues here uh, know well and support, mandates the role of women in the peace and security continuum, in peace and security discussions, in negotiations, in mediations. So the legislative framework, if you like, is there. What's lacking today, the challenge is implementation. So today, less than 10% of women are negotiators, mediators in peace and conflict situations. Uh, and it's for the Security Council and for the UN itself to step up and make sure that becomes a higher and higher figure. But we know, as you said, Kristalina said it well yesterday, that peace agreements could last 35 years and more just simply by the simple solution of adding women around the peace and security table when you decide the peace deal. 35 years and more, but they're likely to fail uh, in five years or less if you don't. So again, if you need the data to prove that it's not only the right thing to do, it's the smart thing to do, the data's there. We've got the numbers. Uh, so if you look at all the conflicts uh, around the world, intrastate, cross-state conflict, civil war, uh, the many conflicts that the UN is currently mediating and negotiating, that's one of the fixes that the UAE certainly and all my colleagues here uh, supports very strongly. Include women in the peace negotiations, include them as mediators, include them around the table. Women bring the full spectrum of considerations when they negotiate a peace settlement. It's not just about power sharing, sorry to be binary about it, but it's not simply about power sharing, it's also about access to justice, access to social services, access to medical help and facilities, access to education, and why that is a core pillar of women's empowerment around the world. These are some of the things that I think women have been proven to bring to the table in most scenarios, and that is why it's such a core part of the UAE's foreign policy objective that they are at the table. Great, fantastic, actually. Uh, Mimosa, I'd love to talk to you about, and. Uh, Lana was pointing to the data, so you can go find the data. Uh, one of the pieces of data that was shared in preparation for this panel was that it'll take 52 years to get gender parity in parliaments. Wow. <laughs> Do we really have to wait 52 <laughs> years to get gender parity? That was pretty shocking in itself. Give us a taste in Kosovo, because you're a member of parliament. Uh, you were a trailblazer going back to your hometown to become the mayor. Uh, you said something very interesting when we talked on the phone. You said, you know, I lost the first attempt at it, and it made me much stronger, much more determined. So it's, it's a lot in you know, yes. one question, but I'll follow yeah. up on it if, if necessary. Uh, first, tell us, do you really think it should take 52 years to get gender parity <laughs> in a parliament? Yes. Thank you, John, and a uh, great pleasure to be here. Actually, um, if it takes 52 years to gender parity, then uh, definitely we need to go a faster pace to gender parity. Uh, I truly believe that it's going to take less because I see the determination and the commitment not only of women but also of men to make gender parity and equality in general uh, come to the point where we all will benefit from it. Uh, well, I 
in this short period of time of Kosovo's life, actually today is Kosovo's birthday, it just marked 12th anniversary of uh, mm. independence. In, and I have 11 years in politics uh, and 17 years in public life. So it has been quite a tremendous effort altogether, participated in six sets of election, three local level and three jet in the central level. Uh, and when I started it, I started it at the local level in 2009 as a uh, women candidate for a mayor position, a position that was never held by a woman before in Kosovo. I lost that election in very contested battle. Uh, it was very near uh, a, sh a very uh, low percentage that uh, uh, the uh, other side won, uh, but uh, I've kept fighting. One thing that I've realized is that if actually I give up, I would be defined by that loss. And I said to myself, I don't want to be mm. a woman being defined by the loss. I want to be a woman that keeps fighting and going, uh, Next election that I went, it was the year after uh, the general election, I was the most voted woman in the parliament. And it was not because my previous political experience, it's because all the effort that I put in into battling on the local level. And I realized that people appreciated the effort, not only women, but men as well. Um, I held the position of Minister of Trade and Industry and Deputy Prime Minister from those uh, general election. Um, had made huge effort into uh, improving business climate, made huge turn for Kosovo in the World Bank doing business index. When I got into the ministry, the Kosovo was ranked 129th in the World Bank doing uh, business. When I left the ministry, Kosovo was at 63. Mm. So it was a huge yeah. uh, effort. Thank you. But during all that period, it was not only the uh, business environment. There was discussions in negotiations with EU on stabilization association agreement that countries of Western Balkans are part of. Uh, there was also a, a series of trade uh, agreements and trade, effective trade policies that we were putting in place. But with all that, I still had my heart in one place, and that was my hometown, Jakova. So I left, at, uh, in 2013, I resigned. Uh, for my position to go run again when the new local elections were announced. Well, it's quite a leap to go from deputy prime minister to mayor of your hometown. <laughs> After three years, actually, <laughs> I've, I was able to show what a woman can do and wh how you can be when you are really focused on policy changes. But then I said, this is one thing that we also have to do to show that women can be uh, good mayors, that women can actually go to the other side and say, well, this is not a position that is no go for women. Um, it was two sets of elections, like uh, f the first round and then the second round, and then I won. And I, I thinking, going back and thinking of all the joy and happiness and cheerful of people that, you know, finally uh, the change has come. Because it was my uh, campaign was also associated with the change that is needed, going back to more development agenda rather than just looking back to what war had caused us. I come from a, a, a town that was the most devastating during the war in Kosovo, oh. with the highest number of people killed and a lot of uh, damages. But still, uh, the focus should have been toward the future as I was looking at it. So uh, all in all, uh, when I was able to reach that new standard, uh, I've, I had this feeling that there's nothing unreachable for women. And oftentimes when we face difficulties, um, I see in everyone who goes into politics, men or women, have a feeling that yes, we're here for others. But I truly believe that women politicians have uh, doubled the responsibility because they're not only there for everyone, they're also there to um, inspire uh, young girls to actually go into politics and take on decision making. Because if I fail, if any one of us fails, it's not just a personal failure. It's a failure that echoes to others, like, see, she failed. Uh, and we don't want to be associated with failure. Great. I, I, I want to uh, open this up so you can share uh, your tales. And I think it would be extremely valuable, particularly for some of the younger attendees in the audience, uh, to say, what is the right toolbox for the 21st century? Because I'm having this conversation with my daughters are 14 and 17, and the workforce of tomorrow is going to be far different than the workforce for today. So one quick question for you, Ryan, is like, what are the laws and legislation and the educational uh, legislation that's going to place in Egypt to say, you know, we need these skills from women in the future in our economy, and it's a large economy. Okay, so um, 
uh, technology is an undeniable um, fact today. Uh, everybody knows that with artificial intelligence, etc., so many jobs will be displaced, but also new jobs created. So the idea is to equip, as particularly the women are going to be the first displaced, to equip them with um, uh, the skill sets and the vocational training that can actually allow them to re-engage again in society. So the, the, the buzzword today is STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And um, as governments, uh, we have to be very mindful of that. In fact, that's that been that a conversation space. for five years. Has that conversation infiltrated into policy, would you say? Yes. Uh, for example, um, uh, when it comes to uh, the different institutions that are doing vocational training, there are elements of that, and uh, particularly programs for women. Um, and uh, we try, the, I, think, I think what is required in general is uh, to elevate the narrative on what is happening. Um, because uh, there are many um, fragmented efforts, but we need to consolidate that so that you actually open up this um, uh, uh, realization that there are efforts being done. They're not finished, but uh, they have had progress, and let's continue going, uh, let's continue going forward. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's key. Uh, when you say what is the toolbox uh, for uh, being able to uh, prove yourself or, or have a voice, etc. Education is number one. Uh, number two is always having role models or mentors. Mm. Um, and I will never forget when I was uh, leaving the IMF to go to uh, become minister of, of uh, tourism. Uh, uh, the MD at the time, Christine Lagarde, sent me uh, a very nice email with 10 points, which were Jeez. her, uh, um, what happened to her when she was a minister in France. And she said, you know, you're not going to understand all of these 10 commandments now, but they're going to come very handy. And it's impressive that every one of us basically uh, uh, provides insight uh, to, mm. to others. Something else which is very important because the generations in the region are young and there's always this um, perception uh, women who work and women who have positions uh, are not very feminine. They don't have to, you know, they're very studious. They, but that's not, that's not, that's not correct. And, and basically to, to be able to be good and competent, but at the same time have a stardom effect, I think these are all very important messages. Social media today provides us with means to communicate, communicate very fast, communicate uh, uh, rigorously. Um, and I think we need to use these tools to encourage more women uh, as you mentioned, to inspire, to, uh, to lead, uh, to only to dream that you can do it and you can be there and you should not be intimidated by circumstances. You know, it's funny, uh, you say social media, you're being very extremely modest because you have a big following, but every time we do an interview together, I go in and look at the comments, but I love the fact that the men weigh in and like, gosh, she makes us proud, oh my God, we have this woman. She's trazing, uh, bla uh, you know, trailblazing, but I would think it, those comments would come from women kind of instinctually in Egypt, but it's the men that show the, the backing for you, which I think is impressive, in a sector, particularly in tourism. Yeah. which is unheard of. Right? I think, I, think the, um, uh, I was raised to be gender blind, so I don't see man, woman. Uh, I never wanted to be uh, labeled as the only woman in the room, but the best person in the room or, or a competent right. person in the room. And I think, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is a, a feeling which is important. People uh, want to see success and be part of it. And uh, when you are able to, uh, uh, yesterday we had this session at the beginning about intentional leadership. You go in with an intention to do well. You are authentic with your message. You are present in every moment. You just do your best. Um, and I think uh, you know, the reactions I get on, on social media from the many followers uh, just creates a lot of energy. Uh, it, it adds a bigger responsibility. Uh, I feel each one of them is someone I know, even though I don't know them. And, and every time I post something, I feel it's as if uh, I'm going on Broadway, you know, and the <laughs> curtains open up. So I, I thank them for all the, uh, uh, really, the energy that they provide yeah, in doing my on. job. Miriam, I know you have uh, concerns about the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and if we're not careful, this will be a dislocator for women. Uh, Rania talk, talked about STEM. It's, it's all yes. part of that same narrative. Yeah. But what do you mean concretely about that? So first of all, I wanted to say some of the examples of what the UAE is doing to prepare ourselves for the future and to ensure that women are getting the right skill sets. Um, so we have the Advanced Skills Strategy, which was launched in 2018. Uh, just a few months ago, we announced for the Mohammed bin Zayed uh, University for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, I mean, we have also a minister in charge of advanced sciences and also our 
uh, Mars um, mission is uh, composed of 34% women who are actually tasked to get the uh, hope up this year. Yeah. So just those examples, just to show you how the UAE has really pushed women to the next level when it comes to what they can do in the STEM field. Can I ask you something? Um, uh, when we see in the space program when Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid yeah. sets the bar. Do you ever say, God, that bar is a little bit too <laughs> high for us? I, I think, oh, that's nice. He's promoting us, but... Uh, we, we don't have impossible in our, in, right. our, in our vocab. There's no impossible. <laughs> yeah. So... But I look like there's serious stretch targets sometimes, but... Uh, you know, at the end of the day, John, it's our journey to get there. And because our leadership empower us so much and all the achievements that we've, we've made so far, it motivates us and we think, no, 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 we can, we can, we will. And we work really hard to do it and everyone supports each other. And if I look at now, for example, food security, when I talk to the youth and I don't look for the next farmer, I look for the next agri-technologist, mm -hmm. okay? So I give them a cool name. I want them to think of the food security sector as something exciting. We all love food, we love technology, we're, we're using it all the time. If we combine that and, and find out new ways of how we can produce food, manage food, uh, how we can waste less food, this is the beauty. And, I, and what we are trying to do is give the women those skill sets needed for the future jobs that will be coming in this. There'll be things like in the gene editing section and the biotechnology. There's so many exciting things when we see now food is made in a lab or uh, food is made in 3D printing. There are so many things that technology can help us in closing the food demand gap that we okay, have. I want to circle around with you about health as well because they're related to uh, health. Uh, Lana, and, and uh, Miriam touched on this. Uh, you have a fantastic educational pedigree uh, at Cambridge and at uh, the School of Ori uh, Oriental and Asian Studies in, in London as well. And I think this is, it gives you a certain power. The reason I wanted to ask you this, why is it so important? You're the same, University of Maryland and the degrees you got at such an early age. Why is it so important? What sort of strength does it give you to have that sort of pedigree and say, you know, go ahead, give it to me. I can handle anything in terms of context, flexibility, history, decision-making in terms of having that sort of education, would you suggest? John, I think you've answered the question, which is the next decade, the toolbox that's going to be required by policymakers, by diplomats, by young students is going to need to be one that is agile, that is resilient, that is flexible, that is cross-cutting. So those speak to some of the initiatives that Her Excellency Miriam was speaking about, uh, which, you know, to add to that, our foreign minister, His Highness Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed, is now chairing an educational council that is looking at matching uh, schools and the education system in our country to the workforce requirements of the future. So not only are we looking at our international foreign policy through that lens, we're now also very much looking at our national strategy through that lens. Um, it's not about where you go to university, it's not about where you go to school. I really firmly believe it's about the skill sets that you learn uh, from your surrounding environment, from your community. And that's something that's very strong in the UAE. The community environment, the educational learning, the peer-to-peer -peer learning is a very, very strong and very vibrant part of our, uh, our engagement with our colleagues. So again, to Miriam's point, uh, why does this matter here in our part of the world? And I'd like to just mention another data point, if I may, but over the last five years, a study has been done for Arab youth around the region. Where would they most like to live and work? And for five years, Arab youth in the region has chosen the UAE over Canada, the West, the United States, and other places. And I firmly believe that it's not because it's got nice infrastructure or good schools uh, or uh, nice public spaces or all, and safety and security. Of course, those are all part of these things. But I think it's to do with what uh, Miriam touched on, which is the inspirational message, the high benchmark, the vision of hope for the region at a time where very nihilistic narratives are dominating in our part of the world and trying to take youth into that narrative, into that very nihilistic view of the future. So yes, it's, it's a fantastic vision by His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid that we want to, to do this Mars probe. It was great that we uh, put our first astronaut, Hazal Mansouri, into space. That was phenomenal for youth, not just in our country, but for around the region, that this is an Arab country that used to be able to do this uh, hundreds of years ago and somehow lost its way but is now coming back to that in countries like the United Arab Emirates. What an amazing signal to the youth of our region that that is an aspiration and a goal. So I think that's what this message is also about. Set the benchmark high and then do your best to run towards and try and achieve it. And 
as Miriam said, it's not just that our founding father, His Highness Sheikh Zayed, uh, believed that. It's also that we have a living role mo model in Her Highness Sheikh Fatima bint Mubarak, who continues to lead that charge uh, in the UAE today for women's empowerment. So just on a very smaller scale of the peace and security architecture, she now uh, has contributed to the United Nations to fund peacekeepers, women peacekeepers, not just ah from the region, but from mm. around the world, from Asia, from Africa, to make sure that women really are part of the peace and security continuum. Those are the kinds of initiatives that we don't uh, talk about, we don't publicize enough, but I think it's that vision of hope for the region. I think it's that vision of understanding that women are the most vulnerable when the automation uh, impact sets in and that we have to try and create that resilience in our societies. Uh, and I think it's that firm leadership, both from our men, but also fundamentally from our women in this country, uh, that makes this model uh, quite important to all of us. Great. Uh, you said about uh, Her Highness Sheikh Fatima. She does it so discreetly that you wouldn't know it. That's what's uh, part of the beauty of it all. It's like the secret uh, weapon that the country has, but you would never know she was uh, doing that. But mostly you've had phenomenal opportunity. Educated at Duquesne University uh, in Pittsburgh. Ron Brown scholar, Fulbright program scholar. Uh, what did that do for Kosovo and the skill set you learned abroad, the exposure you had to the United States in those studies? And how you applied that, it's very interesting, the technical programs you've set up in Kosovo. So for those who don't have a higher education, you're still suggesting you can train them at the local level for jobs of the future. Yes. Um, I think the, it's not just the general knowledge or technical knowledge that you get. The fact that we are able to go from a country that is considered underdeveloped country or at my time a country just, just went through the war uh, and be able to study at... Um, universities in the United States is showing itself that the opportunities um, are there and there is no limit to actually reaching uh, your life goal. Uh, there I got the, the impression that even when I go home everything is possible. I was studying there for uh, e-commerce at Duquesne University, graduated in 2001, came back home and there was no, not even an ATM. Um, everything was on cash uh, economy at that time. But slowly uh, building it up initially uh, through American Chamber of Commerce with businesses working directly. And then as a mayor, I actually went through this initiative of creating the first uh, makerspace uh, in the Balkans. It was uh, at that time, it was one uh, business person from Kosovo who uh, was working uh, abroad, sold his business, wanted to contribute back home. And he came and he said, I have this idea. Would you give me the space? Uh, despite everyone else saying, oh, this is nothing important, I had this belief that if it's targeting young boys and girls to go into electro-engineering, mechanical engineering, IT programming, then this is it. Because when I was talking about my hometown, giving them the hope and the vision for the future, this was it. This was exactly what I was uh, thinking that is going to target. And we started it, but we started also by uh, having the number of girls enrolled uh, equal to the numbers of boys. And all of a sudden, the progress was so fast that within two years, we had girls that were claiming that they were, their plans were to go study law or economics, and now they want to go do programming. One of the girls, actually, and I'm so proud of her, uh, went through the entire program, uh, went to uh, electrical engineering, and then got a scholarship for women in energy sector in the U.S., uh, a program by MCC in Kosovo. I was like, wow, this is the impact that you have in life of people. This is directly how you believe that right decisions uh, are the one who had made these girls believe that they are equal. Uh, apart from that, uh, as I was listening to the stories on the regional uh, level, I want to say that it's so important also for countries who give, uh, who'd make this progress to make it uh, really public and promote the progress. I remember uh, the inspiration to do uh, business reforms for myself in Kosovo when I was minister was Georgia and, and uh, Rwanda. Uh, and I was thinking Rwanda went through the terrible mm. uh, conflict and the, the loss of people, loss of lives in 96. Kosovo went through the same in 99. And Rwanda was making such a huge progress also in equality. And I was like, these people had overcome uh, everything that had happened. We can do it. We can find the strength to do it as well. Mm. So I think it's so important that in conferences like this, in forums and in discussions, we talk about these successes. It's so important to inspire each other and to go back home and to continue this path. Because yes, definitely, education, accessibility. Tell girls that there's nothing that they cannot do. 
I mean, literally there's nothing. Everything that the boy can do, the girl can do as well. Give them tools and you'll see it. And oftentimes they do much better uh, than boys because they are very attentive. Um, and also uh, make sure that that's widely known. If I had a success in Kosovo, let Rwanda or Georgia or another country know about it, and vice versa, because this is how uh, we understand that it's not about one nation, that it's not about one continent, it's about the globe entirely. And we will come to that parity only when worldwide we would have this equality and, of course, peace. Because let's not forget, there are places of conflict uh, in the world that is going to seek great attention to recovery. And my heart bleeds when I see uh, refugees, when I see uh, hurt and pain, because it happened in my lifetime. I've seen it through my people. Um, loss of life is devastating, but they would need eventually to recover. We have Syria and other countries that we still have the conflict there. And when you see that, you see like, okay, what's going to be the next thing that happened, one that's settled? You know, all of these topics that we're talking about here, they need to be there, transmitted immediately, and then go about by helping and extending the hand to each other. Wow, terrific, very powerful. We have uh, exactly five minutes left. So uh, one of the things I was trying to think, what's the best way we can kind of glean the best advice from you? But what I think is very concerning today, and it's a conversation again we have within the family, is a streak of populism. And I don't want to say it's male-led uh, populism, but I'd say it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good uh, bet to say that. And most of some of the leadership we see uh, in the West and the East today, it's actually quite dangerous. So what can we do as women, as a community, to say, look, this is not the path. This doesn't lead to growth, to Mimosa's point. It doesn't lead to peace. So in your roles, maybe you can just share. The United Nations is very important. Within the government, very important. Within Kosovo, very, very important. We have about about 45 seconds for each um, one of you. What would you say, Rania? Uh, I think uh, I, I'm a policymaker. I love policy work. Uh, I feel governments uh, set a tone and invite and include multilaterals, private sector, etc. So I'm very happy that on the women issue, there's a framework. It's a global framework, um, and we're getting better at it. Uh, it in the past, we used to shy as women talking about women issues. Now, that's not the case. It's not an afterthought. It's not a residual. It's mainstream. And this is very, very important. It sets uh, dialogue. It, it creates a meaning to the policy work because quantification is key. Mm. Uh, and this has happened uh, whenever uh, a policy uh, uh, is changing, whether legislation, whether um, uh, in, in cabinet, etc., you are able to make a family uh, happier and more hopeful, ah. more income. That's the uh, best weapon, is what you're saying. Absolutely, and I think that's the way you can actually go again. I don't. I mean, fend off populism because everyone wants to be hopeful, everyone wants to be happy, and this is what uh, governments should be uh, set out to do with partnerships with private sector, civil society, and international institutions. Okay, Miriam, yeah. it's it's interesting you su suggest this because everybody wants to be. We have a minister yeah. of happiness here, <laughs> this, not on this panel, but we do have exactly, it. Exactly. Well, exactly. How about this idea of uh, the streak of populism and how women can fight it. So I think all of us here and many of you out there, we're trendsetters now. We're, we've really, I think all of us have struggled in showing who we are and what we're good at. Um, each of us in our own field. Uh, I did mechanical engineering in Germany and I was, I think, one in uh, 10 women who were there and there were 600 students in all. So I really had to prove myself. I had to prove that I'm here to learn because I believe in what I want to study and I want to take this back home. And I think all of us have our stories of having to prove who we are. And we hope, of course, to succeed in everything that we're doing to make it easier for the next ones that are coming in. And now if I look at the numbers at the same university, the numbers of women are huge. I'm not mm. saying it's because of me, but it's just we've started a trend. Mm. So uh, in continuing down this path, it's really important for all of us to discuss and share the ideas and also to inspire. It's really like we've got a minister of youth so I do a lot of, uh, I go to the youth hubs and I speak to the, the youth and I tell them, don't be afraid. Uh, there are certain fields, especially when you're talking about STEM, sciences, engineering, that they feel, is this really a woman's role? But yes, it is. Because in the future, we'll be needing all the skill set. And each and everyone has something unique about what they have. So um, 
I think we're trendsetters, and I think uh, just us talking here and sharing our story will hopefully be an inspiration for all of you out there. Um, for food security, every person has a role, by the way. It's not just government, private sector. It's the community and every individual person. What I buy, what I put in the bin, all affects the food security file. So the women at home even have a role to play in this file. Great, okay. Lana, we, uh, we have about a minute 30 for the two of you. We can go over a minute. It's uh, fantastic. I don't want to cut us short at the end. Uh, your thoughts in, in the UN and, and the lack of dialogue. I mean, I've got a premise that because of globalization over the last 25 years, it's caused so much disruption. It's created a lot of growth but there's a backlash to globalization, so this is where the nationalism comes in, and therefore populism. Mm. What's your role in that process and the women of the United Nations? So the UN, as I said at the outset, is a macrocosm of what is happening nationally uh, around the world. And if I just take the UAE as an example, I genuinely believe that our biggest strength is that we recognize that diversity and inclusion is our biggest resource. So today, we all live and reside in a country where upward of 199 uh, nationalities, religions, cultures have helped build this country. I think if you try and reflect that model on the global stage, you have one of the solutions, not all of them, but you have one of the solutions for how to strengthen uh, international cooperation and the multilateral system. And that is, again, that our strength lies in inclusion. Uh, we are as strong as the weakest member and the most vulnerable member of our society. Uh, and that's true internationally as well, whether it's migration, one of the biggest calamities of our time, the um, amount of people who have been displaced and lost their homes because of conflict uh, and civil war, and how we resettle them into communities that are safe and structured for their lives and their families, um, whether it's climate change, and again, we come back to the multilateral system. It was the UN that forged the Paris Climate Agreement, one of the most uh, important uh, international agreements on climate that we have managed to forge as an international community, whether it's the uh, Agenda 2030, the Sustainable Development Goals, which include as as goal number five, gender empowerment, as one of our global strategies. So despite the criticism of multilateralism, despite the criticism of the fractured state of global politics, when the international community comes together, as it does around one table at the UN every day, I think we as a people, as humanity, are at our best. Uh, and I think it's for all of us, small, medium, large countries, to make sure that system is upheld, to make sure that system stays strong and resilient, because it's not only our security that is benefited by that, it's the entire international communities. And that's the job I know that I and my colleagues very much believe in in our job at the UN. Great, thank you very much. Yeah, it's excellent. Mimosa, I think uh, having had such a conflict in the region for so long, uh, the last thing you want to hear is uh, outcries of populism and nationalism, correct? What's the yeah. lesson we learned out of that from you? Uh, well, I think that there are two elements to uh, when we have parties or nationalists uh, winning. The first is when people take democracy for granted. We believe that they either abstain from the elections or they say, oh, yeah, we're good. Um, probably the person who is running and is nationalist or populist uh, would never win, and they win because they abstain. And the second, when leaders um, actually lose touch uh, with the real problems of people, and then you have nationalist forces come in, and, and or with the populism language that draws the attention and wins. Um, the, the support of people. I truly believe that we should not be taking democracy for granted anywhere in the world. We should be working on daily basis, and we should definitely uh, change the approach as politicians to be closer to people and understanding. Every time the politicians or decision makers are not close to people, there's someone else who's close, using the opportunity to actually uh, gain on ground. And I think uh, women's role is definitely huge because oftentimes most, most of the problems and policies we work on are those that are missing. And therefore, mm. this is why it's so important by increasing number of women in politics and in decision making in general, you will have less populism and as, less nationalism because we tend to be very pragmatic about what is needed and what are uh, some of the real concrete uh, sort of uh, issues that we need to work for the benefit of people. Uh, let's not leave the vacuum so populism uh, gains it. Uh, I think it's very important that anywhere where the democracy is functioning, we work more on it, make it harder, and not just, I mean, make it stronger, not just uh, believing that, yeah, we have it already. It's never a done deal. There's no finished it's line. It's work I mean, it's in progress. It's profound in a sense because there's a lot of criticism of democracy today. And, you know, the economists and others say uh, democracy is dead. 
And you're saying we should fight for, for the living in to make sure it gets modernized. She's um, saying women are the answer to everything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's what she was actually saying. <laughs> no, actually, I, 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 I don't really, I, to be honest, with what, what I've seen for the, the male community, I have zero argument with that. So uh, let's leave it there, shall we? Uh, Mimosa Lila is great. Landon Nasibi, Miriam Almo Harry, Rania Almo Shot. Uh, nice round of applause. Fantastic discussion. Thank you very, very much. Thanks.